Welcome to Exploring Kabbalah, an introduction to an ancient Jewish mystical tradition, one that's inspired contemporary interest, interpretation, and practice. We begin with a seemingly simple question. How exactly is the very word pronounced? For answers, we turn to Rabbi Ari Solish of Chabad in town in Atlanta, an Orthodox Jewish community. It's a great question. So I've, I've heard it many different ways. Um, I will tell you the Hebrew, the traditional Hebrew way of, pr- of pronouncing the word is Kabbalah. Kabbalah is a Hebrew word that means received or tradition. And it's, inter- it's an interesting word. You know, Judaism is very much associated with tradition. I think the song Filler on the Roof made it tradition, made it very, very popular. So tradition is, uh, in Judaism, a very, important, a very important element, and in many cultures and societies and religion is very important. Um, but Jewish mysticism specifically is referred to as the Kabbalah, which is the received wisdom. Although all of Jewish teaching, Jewish uh, thought, has been received, if you will, by one generation from the previous generation, it's specifically associated with the Jew- Jewish mystical teachings. And one of the reasons for that is because without the tradition, the Kabbalah remains a locked work that cannot be opened by the average individual. A common understanding is that one cannot begin to study Kabbalah until you reach the age of 40. What I mean by a locked work is that the way that it's written, the way that Kabbalah is written, is it's pretty much encoded in a very cryptic language, in order to keep it away from the masses. This is an ancient, one of the ancient protocols of the Kabbalah was to relegate it to a very very exclusive group of students, very exclusive group of students that had gone through years of study. And as you mentioned, this is where I'll mention the the age-old restriction of being 40 years old. And it wasn't just the age 40. It was being 40 years of of age, as well as being well-versed and learned in all areas of Judaism, in in biblical texts, in Talmudic texts, in Midrashic texts, in Jewish legal texts. It's it's a person that was well-versed, an expert, if you will, in all of these texts, and was 40, was deemed to be appropriate to to welcome into the circle of the mystics, of the Kabbalists. Um, So it's not just the age. The reason for 40 is that It says in Jewish tradition that until one is 40, one's understanding, one's one's mind is not fully formed. Um, I can't comment on this scientifically or biologically the way we understand the brain today. I don't know if there's a significance in our current uh, scientific understandings of the age 40, but certainly in Jewish tradition it says that when a person turns 40, they gain a measure of bina. Bina means understanding. So it, it, it it was... accepted as the tradition that until one is 40 and one's mind is fully settled, it's not a good idea to introduce esoteric wisdom that might confuse um, or befuddle the, uh, the student. So the idea is have a solid foundation in, in the rest of Jewish teachings, have a solid, um, have, gain that type of settling of mind, and then we can introduce the individual to Kabbalistic teachings. Now, with that being said, and I know this is something that we'll talk about a little bit later on as we progress through the generations of Kabbalistic teachings. Um, today, that restriction is, for the most part, not adhered to. And so people will study and teach Kabbalah even under the age of 40. And there's a reason why, and, and we can get into that. Um, I, I don't know if we want to get into it now or if we can get into it soon. I, I, just to mention quickly now the reason for that, it's because The way Kabbalah is, in the latter generations, I mean, over the last four or five centuries, so Kabbalah has been taught in a way that is accessible to the masses. The great mystics saw fit um, in in more more recent times to open up the floodgates, to open up the, uh, the, 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 the wisdom and make it accessible to to everyone, for very specific reasons, historically. What were these teachings that were so complex they should remain hidden from the masses? The way I usually explain it is Kabbalah speaks of two realities. 
It speaks about the cosmic realities, i.e. the spiritual realities of the universe, God and the higher realms of existence. And at the very same time, at the very same time it speaks of the reality inside of us, our spirit that we possess, that, 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 that we possess inside that drives us and animates us and inspires us and, uh, and, and, and carries us through our life here on earth. So really when you look at it, Kabbalah speaks of the macrocosm and the microcosm. It speaks very big, very large. It speaks about God, and I'll use a term now that's a very classic Kabbalistic term. It speaks about sfirot, which are divine emanative energies that are, at, that are in the, woven in the fabric of creation, which we can talk about at greater length uh, soon. But it speaks of these, these grand ideas and realms beyond our reality of, of, of existence. And it speaks, so it speaks of these higher elements. At the same time, it speaks about what's inside of us. So it's like exploring the beyond and exploring the within. And although it sounds like it couldn't, these two, these two um, areas of, of, of discussion, of focus, of study, couldn't be further from each other, the, tr the truth is they are intimately connected. Because when you understand the spiritual energies in the universe, you can understand the spiritual realities inside yourself. And conversely, when you understand the spiritual energies inside yourself, you can understand the patterns of spirituality in the universe itself. It's almost like if you take a drop of water from the ocean, you can get a sense of the type of water that is in the ocean itself. You don't need to analyze all of the water to get a sense of what are the chemical, uh, what, what, are the, what are the properties within these molecules of water in this specific body of water. All you need is one sample. And it's like not, not, not any different than human DNA. You take a small sample, just one hair follicle, and you can get a, get a reading on the entire system of, of the human being. So there's a verse, there's a verse that, that I believe King Solomon writes. It's either King Solomon or King David. It's, uh, it, in the Hebrew, it's umi psari erze eloka. In the English, what it means is from my flesh, I perceive the divine. And there are different ways of understanding this. One simple way of understanding this is that the author is saying, from where I stand, I can still behold something greater than myself. Although I stand here on a physical reality, I can still see, I can gaze up and, and look at and, and behold something greater than myself. But there's another deeper way of understanding it, and that is, me sorry, from my own flesh, when I look at my own self, I can see patterns of the divine. So knowing our own soul actually gives us insight into how God, if you will, operates as well. So these, I would say, if we had to encapsulate what is Kabbalah, what does it speak of, you'll find one of two things. Either it's speaking about God, or it's speaking about the soul. That's pretty much it. These mystical teachings are even believed to date to the time of creation, as recounted in the Hebrew Scripture. So the Jewish Bible, the, uh, the Torah says that Adam and Eve are the first human beings. Adam, according to Jewish tradition, was a Kabbalist. So the very, yeah, the very first human being wasn't just, you know, the guy who got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, which he also was. They both got kicked out. For the, but he was also a mystic. Where do we see this? So there's a tradition that Adam, the first day that he was created, and he was created as an adult. He wasn't created as a, uh, as a baby. So the first, in his first few hours of existence, says that he named all of the animals. He gave them they're Hebrew names. Now, Hebrew is a very powerful language. It's known as the language of creation itself. The 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet are actually the patterns of energy that are in, that, that are, um, that, that, that suffuse reality with life itself. Now, that's another topic that we can get into. Um, but the point is that Hebrew, Hebrew language, the Hebrew letters and Hebrew words are very significant in sort of revealing the energy that drives that thing that's named with that name. So it says that Adam named, gave all of the animals their Hebrew names, which means that he was able to peer into their soul and he was able to assess what type of spirit energy that animal had 
and give the appropriate Hebrew name that reflected that energy. Because as I just mentioned, every Hebrew letter and every Hebrew word carries with it or represents a certain type of divine energy. And so Adam wasn't just the first human being, but he was also the first human being that had insight into spirituality, which makes sense because he was close to the origins of, you know, was close, close to the source with the capital S. So it makes sense that he had, he had some insights. So it says that Adam was a capitalist, Abraham was a capitalist, Abraham, wrote, according to, to many, many commentaries, Abraham wrote the mystical work called Sefer Yitzira, which means the Book of Formation, which is a book that <coughs> details many elements of how God created the universe and how that creation unfolds on a mystical, spiritual um, level. And it's also been said, some, of, some viewers may know and, and have heard of this tradition of the golem, the, uh, um, I don't know how you translate golem, uh, a Frankenstein-esque type of creation that appears throughout Jewish history, including probably most famously in Prague uh, several centuries ago by the great Maharal of Prague, who is, uh, the, the tra tra tradition goes that he created this golem to protect the Jewish people against pogroms and other sorts of uh, libelous and, and, and uh, attacks against the community. But all of the golems are created using the techniques of Sefer Yitzira, authored by, again, according to many, authored by Abraham. So if you want to know how to create, how to take some clay and give it some life, perhaps you can find the answer in Sefer Yitzira. I've looked, I haven't found it yet. But, but it says that, that, those, that have, those that have been able to somehow bring inanimate objects to life, have used Sefer Yitzhir. But my point is, really, when we talk about the development of Kabbalah and who are some notable Kabbalists, so we're talking about Adam, we're talking about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the other patriarchs, are all, the Jewish patriarchs are also considered to have been Kabbalists. Moses was a Kabbalist. It says Moses received the Torah from God at Sinai, and it uses the word Kabel, received, like Kabbalah. So the tradition goes that not only did he receive the simple elements of, uh, of Jewish wisdom, but he also received the esoteric wisdom as well, the hidden wisdom about God and about the soul and about the core of everything. Though Kabbalah flowered in the 13th century in Spain, with the publication of a comprehensive mystical commentary on the Hebrew Bible, a text known as the Zohar, Kabbalah's teachings and understandings of biblical interpretation were never stagnant but continuously evolving over the generations. What happened between the ancient times, times of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and the 1500s? So Kabbalah, and I kind of alluded to this before, Kabbalah was always taught, but always taught in a very secretive group. You had to be on the inside to get the wisdom. You had to, you had to know somebody that knew somebody to get invited, hey, meet me in the forest by the tree and we're gonna, we, have a, we have a small study group over there. So you had to be the right type of person, you had to have the right amount of wisdom, and you had to be trusted with this wisdom as well. And the understanding is that because it speaks so much about God and due to the limitations of human language, so there is some anthropomorphism used. In other words, there is some terminology that typically applies to human beings that is applied to and in the conversation about God and spiritual, spiritual, spirituality. So therefore, it's very important that the student of Kabbalah be very firmly uh, grounded in belief, in awareness of what God is on a general level, so that the student is not confused by what he or she studies in the mystical tradition. So that's another reason why a lot of restriction was put in place about who could study and when they could study, etc. But it was always taught. It was taught, it says that, that, that even the, 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 uh, the prophetic tradition, so all the Jewish prophets, so the, the methodology 
and the way to summon, if you will, a prophetic experience, that is also part of the mystical tradition, the Kabbalistic tradition, and that was taught from Moses to Joshua, from Joshua, who was the, Joshua was the next Jewish leader after Moses, from Joshua to the subsequent Jewish leaders, to all of the prophets, and it was a tradition, unbroken chain of tradition that was passed down. In addition to this, Moses, when he was taught the Torah, when he received the Torah at Mount Sinai, um, so he received not only the written text of the Bible, of the, the five books of Moses, but he received all of the explanations and all of the commentary, if you will, on that as well. All of the explanations were taught to him, and then he was told, write this down. So write these words down, but here's what it means. But what does it mean? It can mean different things on different levels. There are traditionally four levels of Torah interpretation. And it's known as the Pardes, which is the orchard. It stands for, it's an acronym in Hebrew. It stands for, and I'll mention four Hebrew words and I'll explain what they mean. Pshat, Remez, Drush, and Sod. So Pshat, Remez, Drush, Sod, the acronym, the first letter of all those four words is Pardes, which means orchard. If you ever encounter the, the term orchard in a mystical sense, it doesn't mean a bunch of apple trees, what it means is, um, what it means is the, the different layers of interpretation that exist within, within Jewish wisdom, within Torah wisdom. The first is the simple, basic meaning of the verse. The second is what we would call the allegorical meaning, which means that it says one thing, but it hints to something else. Something else that's kind of a parallel idea, but one idea is kind of leading to another idea. Then you have uh, drush. Drush is the homiletical interpretation. That is where you take an idea that's taught in the Bible and you kind of, um, you learn life lessons from it and you apply it uh, in a way that can further our character, for example. Some character-driven life lessons from biblical text. And then you have the fourth dimension, which is known as sod, which literally means the secrets. And so that's where the Kabbalah lies in that fourth dimension of, of Jewish thought. So it's almost like if you peel layers of an onion, let's say. So you have an outer layer, you peel that back, you have now a, a, a more inner layer, you peel that back, an inner layer, and then you get to the core of it. The core of it is the secret, the sod. That all four levels of, of Torah knowledge, of, of Jewish wisdom, that was all transmitted to Moses at Sinai. And Moses then passed it down from, he was the teacher from mentor to disciple, and then from mentor to disciple throughout the generations, typically taught in smaller groups. There were specific individuals throughout the ages that did a more, I would say that went a little bit more public with the teachings. So notably, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, known as the Rashbi. So he was a great sage that lived in the, the first and second centuries of the Common Era. It's around the year 135. So we're talking 135, 18, 1900 years ago, whatever, like almost 2000 years ago. So in the year 135, um, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai began opening up his wisdom. He was a student of Rabbi Akiva, who was also a mystic. In fact, the Talmud says, parenthetically, that Rabbi Akiva was one of four notable scholars who went into the orchard. It says, Arba Nichnas Lapardes, four entered the orchard. I mentioned before, entering the orchard is not just walking into a field, into a place that things are growing. It means entering into a mystical experience as well, because it has now all four dimensions of, of scholarship. So the Talmud says the four entered the orchard. One died, one became a heretic, one went mad, he lost his sanity, and only Rabbi Akiva entered in peace and left in peace. He clearly was of the, and, and, and by the way, that's a cautionary tale that the Talmud says that not everyone is ready to jump into the secrets, the deep secrets of Kabbalah, because it can, it can affect one in a, very, uh, in a very dramatic way, and not always is the person able to handle 
that type of experience. I can liken it to, if, if, if viewers are wondering, like, what does that actually mean? Maybe a, a physical analogy that we can give is gazing at the sun. So you would say, what's wrong with the sun? The sun's a wonderful thing. We, all, the sun, we need the sun to live. You need sunlight. You need warmth. You, and, and the sun is, is bright. It's beautiful. So why not look at the sun? The answer is because the eye, the eye is not designed to look at the sun directly. And if you look at the sun directly, it can actually harm the physical structure of the eye. So the, the parallel is drawn that the same thing is true with Kabbalah. Kabbalah is such pure divine wisdom in its most brilliant form, its most luminous form, that just staring at it without sunglasses, without the proper protection, so to speak, could, be, uh, could have a negative, a deleterious effect on the individual that is studying it. And so therefore, the Talmud is telling us that four entered, three didn't survive the experience in a healthy way. Three weren't able to integrate it in a healthy way. Only Rabbi Kiva was. He was able to enter in peace and exit in peace. One of his primary students was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is known as one of the greatest mystics of all time in that not only did he know the tradition, but that he taught the tradition in an unparalleled way so it's, a, it's, it's around the year 135. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he was wanted by the Roman, uh, by, by, by the Romans. There were severe Roman decrees on Judea at that point. The temp, second temple had been destroyed in the year 70. The Jews, many Jews, millions of Jews had been uh, uh, brutally slain in the Roman um, conquering of the temple. They destroyed the Holy Temple, they raised it to the ground, except for the Western Wall, which exists today, um, still today. They, lots of bloodshed, and they expelled many of the Jews outside of the land of Israel. Some pockets remained, um, and then there was a certain point in time where there were revolts. The Jews tried to throw, overthrow the Romans that had overthrown them, so to speak. And so eventually the Romans really put down uh, tightened the screws on the Jewish community, and they said there's no teaching Torah publicly, there's no Jewish ritual that's allowed, and, uh, and they, they just very, very difficult decrees against Jewish life and Jewish continuity. But well, one of those that defied these, uh, um, these, these decrees was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, to the point that he was wanted, he was sought uh, to be killed by the Roman government. So the tradition has it, the Talmud discusses this, that he hid in a cave for 13 years with his son, and it was in that time that he really uh, formulated to a greater extent and taught to his son to a greater extent the teachings of Kabbalah of Jewish mysticism. When he got out, and he lived a number of years after that, so he began teaching this a little bit more publicly. And on the last day of his life, he taught this to an even greater extent. Um, these, these teachings were written down, and they form probably the most famous work of Kabbalah known as the Holy Zohar, the Zohar HaKadosh. Now, Zohar is the name in, in Hebrew, and it literally means radiance. So you might see it in English as called the Book of Radiance. The Book of Radiance is the Book of the Zohar, and it contains a very comprehensive collection of Jewish mysticism. So although I mentioned before Sefer Yetzir, the Book of Formation, uh, possibly, possibly written by Abraham, we don't find a thor thorough and comprehensive work of Jewish mysticism, of uh, very expansive and comprehensive, like the Zohar, until about 135 of the Common Era. And it's then that he teaches Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, expounds these teachings, and, and they are written down. Now, there's a very interesting story with the book of the Zohar, because it was not published until about 1100 years later, in the 13th century. Uh, 12th and 13th century, uh, I think it was in the 1200s, um, by Rabbi Moses de Leon, Moshe de Leon of, uh, of Spain. Now, it wasn't, it did not see a public exposure until the 13th century. So you will have some scholars today that argue that the Zohar does not date back to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai in the year 135, but rather it originates in Spain in the, the 1200s. But, but, but 
all traditional Jewish thought and scholars at that time, they accepted the Zohar to have much earlier origins. In other words, in, in the 1200s when this was published, it was understood then, and all the writings that we have from that era, all the rabbis and the scholars that oversaw the project of, of, of its publication and its study, they are unanimous in this thought that it dates back to a much earlier period. Now, how did it, where was it for a thousand years, and how did it resurface? There are different origin theories. Some say that a scholar, um, Ramban Nachmanides, he had it with him. Th that it was, it was, this work had been passed down from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his students who wrote it down from generation to generation throughout the ages. It was passed down in secret, in manuscript form, and this rabbi had it in Israel. He sent it to Spain. He sent it to Spain to his son, but it ended up in the wrong address with Moses de Leon. He got a hold of it and he published it. So that's one origin story. There are other origin stories that some someone found it somewhere, buried somewhere, or locked away somewhere in some ancient uh, place of manuscripts. Whatever. There's different origin stories. I don't know which one is is correct. I don't think anyone knows which one is accurate. But the general consensus amongst amongst traditional Jewish scholars, dating back centuries, is that the Zohar was written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He was this profound mystic in, in and around the year 135. He didn't author it himself, he taught it, but his students wrote it down, and it was published much later. So that serves as a seminal work of Kabbalistic thought. The Zohar, however, if anybody wants to open up the Zohar, you know, crack it open and, and, and read it, extremely cryptic, very difficult to understand. So a student without Kabbalistic training and without knowing how to read it is not really going to get anything tangible. What you'll get is esoterics. What you're going to get is, wow, this sounds really profound. It sounds up there, but I have no idea what it means. The student of Kabbalah would need a key to unlock the code. Find out when that key appears and where in the next edition of Exploring Kabbalah.